Hello YouTube. In this video, I will talk about using CO2 in a high-tech aquarium. I guess the fundamental question is, what does carbon dioxide injection give? Aquatic plants, just like land plants, extract carbon from carbon dioxide to produce sugars and oxygen. About 40% of aquatic plant mass, dry mass, is made out of carbon. From this, we can see that carbon is a major nutrient that the plant requires to grow. In a low-tech tank, CO2 is often the ceiling that caps the growth rates in a tank. Therefore, the common recommendation that having excessive light over a low-tech tank does not achieve a higher growth rate. By injecting CO2 into the tank, we break this CO2 limitation and we can achieve growth rates 5 to 7 times faster compared to a low-tech tank. At the other extreme end, CO2 also lowers the minimum amount of light necessary for plant growth. In a tank devoid of CO2, the plant must devote considerable energy to CO2 seeking activities. However, with CO2 enrichment, the plant can devote the same energy to growth instead. This means that the range of lighting that will grow plants is much wider in a CO2 enriched tank. Plants that will not grow in the shade in a low tech tank, for example, may do so when there is CO2 injection. The benefits of CO2 enrichment goes beyond increased growth rates. On this page, the plants on the left are the same plants as those on the right, except that those on the left are grown in a low-tech environment, whereas those on the right are grown with CO2 enriched waters. The substrate as well as fertilization regime are similar, and what you see is that the plants grown in CO2 enriched waters have much better coloration as well as much nicer growth forms. The leaves are fuller and the rates really stand out in the CO2 enriched tank. Lack of adequate CO2 enrichment is also the number one reason that some people cannot grow HC. It is a myth that HC requires very high lighting to grow. It does spread faster with high lighting. However, with medium or even low lighting and adequate CO2 enrichment, it grows just fine. So this is the diagram of a typical CO2 system. It looks more confusing than it is actually. Many shops sell the entire system as a complete package. So you don't need to buy the individual items by themselves. Typically, you need a cylinder to contain the CO2 gas. This is connected to a regulator that steps down the pressure and allows a small amount of CO2 to be channeled out at once. The regulator connects to a check valve the check valve prevents water from the tank from uh, seeping back to the regulator and damaging it. After the check valve, we will put the bubble counter. The bubble counter uh, is a device that allows you to see the rate of injection of CO2 into the tank. After the bubble counter, uh, at the final stage, is either a diffuser or in some cases a reactor. And this is where the CO2 mixes with your tank water. You can buy a regulator without a solenoid attached, but the solenoid allows you to control the timing of CO2. Basically, when the solenoid is plugged into the power outlet, it allows CO2 to flow through the valve. And when the solenoid power is cut, it stops the flow of CO2 into the tank. This allows you to put the solenoid onto a timer and only uh, allow the CO2 to flow in the day when the lights are on and the plants are photosynthesizing. This is an alternative setup where the CO2 is not channeled to an in-tank diffuser but instead is channeled to an exterior reactor. The exterior reactor is part of the filter outflow and it mixes with the water from the filter outflow before entering the tank. And so the great debate begins. Should one use an external reactor or an in-tank diffuser? And if so, what is the difference? Let me begin first by saying this, and I know many people do not know this, that there are two ways of getting CO2 to the plants. The first method is by saturating the water with CO2, and the other is by the physical mist of CO2 actually hitting the plants. A CO2 reactor typically traps most of the CO2 bubbles in the reactor itself, and this can give a very high rate of dissolution of CO2. However, because there is no CO2 exiting the, the reactor, there is lack of a CO2 mist in the tank. An in-tank diffuser on the other hand, 
can be much less efficient at saturating the water with CO2 instead and this leads to a lot of wastage of CO2 trying to get a good rate of saturation also unless you use one of the atomizer types that provides a very fine mist the CO2 misting effect might not be strong unless you really turn up the diff the rate of CO2 using the inline diffuser. A more optimized scenario to get the maximum amount of CO2 to the plants is to have the maximum am amount of uh, CO2 dissolution possible, which is about 30 35 parts per million before the fish get irritated. And on top of that, we provide a CO2 mist in the tank. For myself nowadays, I use an inline atomizer unit that gives a good rate of dissolution and it also sprays out a very fine mist that makes its way all around the tank. However, we are not done yet. The next point I want to talk about is that CO2 levels in the tank are independent of O2 levels. And fishes in our tank need O2 to survive. When given an elevated level of oxygen in the water, they can withstand an even higher amount of CO2 compared to a tank that just has average level of oxygen. There are many methods of uh, raising the O2 levels in the tank. For Tomba, he uses sums in most of his tanks. Uh, for ADA, they use lip pipes or surface agitation to increase the O2 levels. Myself, I use either surface agitation or lily pipes. The lily pipe, if correctly designed, creates a vortex um, just below the water surface that sucks down surface scum and this also has the effect of oxygenating the water. In summary, to get really high levels of CO2 to your plants, it seems the method would be to saturate the water with O2, either using some or surface agitation. Next is to saturate the water with CO2, using either an efficient reactor or diffuser. And lastly, by introducing a CO2 mist throughout the tank, where the physical CO2 bubbles hit the leaves of the plants. Not all tanks require a super high level of CO2, um, it's just that this methodology gives flexibility to people who want to experiment with very high lighting. Optionally, for people who keep sensitive fish or stream, you may not want your water to be so saturated with CO2. So perhaps instead, you can opt for the CO2 mist doing most of the work in the tank. Okay, last topic. How do we determine CO2 levels in the tank? The bubble counter itself is not a good gauge of CO2 levels. Uh, as a demonstration, I ran two bubble counters on the same CO2 line and as you can see, the one on the bottom has a much faster rate compared to the one at the top because the one at the top produces larger bubbles. At the hobbies level, there is no super precise way to know our exact CO2 levels. However, by measuring the pH drop caused by CO2, we can get a fairly good gauge of where our levels lie. Whether you measure this drop in pH using a uh, pH probe or a drop tracker or a, a indicator solution, they are all the similar methods of varying accuracies of determining uh, the level of pH drop. And all of them have their weaknesses. For example, the pH probe is accurate, however it needs to be calibrated and it doesn't work well for tanks where you have a buffering substrate or if you use limestone because this changes your pH and KH levels continuously. The Drop checker on the other hand lags quite a bit before showing results. So this is how it works. First you measure your tank pH, um, say it is 7.3 and you measure your tank's KH and let's say it is 4. You look it up in, on the table and you'll come to the conclusion that if uh, these are the only two factors affecting pH, then the resultant CO2 level in the tank will be about 7 ppm. Now if you look further up the table to where the white boxes are, those are the recommended PPA levels between 15 to 30. You need to inject enough CO2 into the tank to drop the pH, for example from 7.3 to 6.7 in this particular instance to put yourself at 27 ppm CO2. If you have a drop checker with an indicator solution, like those two on the right, it should have gradually changed from the colour on the top picture to the colour in the bottom picture. If you further increase the rate of injection of CO2, the drop checker may turn yellow 
indicating a very high level of CO2 that may potentially stress fish. I've seen quite a few tanks that run just fine with uh, yellow drop checkers as in the rate of uh, CO2 in the water is really high but you do need to increase the oxygen to prevent the fish from dying. In the end, I would like to say that I'm not recommending that everyone immediately go tune up their CO2 to insane levels. Rather, I hope that I've presented a variety of techniques to manipulate the level of CO2 to what is required in your tank depending on the plants and fish and lights that you have. From the other videos, you can see that I'm a fan of the low tank method myself. However, CO2 does give flexibility and it gives results and speed. A density and colors that sometimes may not be feasible in a low tech tank.